me at Jello, Jello. You had me at Jello. You had me at Jello. Oh, you had me at Jello. Playing the Jello has so many pluses. Hi, everybody. It's five o'clock on a Friday. Almost time to binge practice through the whole weekend. But first, Cello Chat. And this cello chat is also brought to us by Taft Violins, based in Madison. I highly recommend them. Taftviolins.com. Very easy. Do check them out. My guest this week is William Calloway, orchestra director at Fort Atkinson High School. How are you doing, Bill? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. And I've been looking forward to, to talking with you very much. So can you introduce yourself and tell about your musical background? Yeah, sure. So um, I went to UW-Eau Claire uh, for my undergrad and studied music education there and um, had a really, really good experience, loved the environment. Um, and since uh, I graduated there, I applied um, for the Ford Atkinson job and um, was really enthused to get that job and this is year five and I'm still really, really, really enjoying it. Um, I truly enjoy going to work every day, which, you know, I don't take for granted. And um, at Fort Atkinson, I teach uh, at the middle school and the high school. So I teach sixth through 12th grade um, and we have a pretty cool setup. We have a um, co-teaching model at the middle school. So I have a colleague, Peter Finnegan, that I work with and then um, at the high school, there's a couple different orchestras there that are curricular and then a co-curricular group as well. So, um, yeah, I'm a cellist. I love playing cello um, and it's a passion of mine. Uh, but my like real true passion is definitely teaching um, and teaching in a classroom setting. So. Terrific. Excellent. So one of the things I definitely want to ask everybody because the running theme is, is inspiration and motivation. What are some of your favorite ways to keep your students, either keep them fired up or when they're having just kind of one of those days or weeks to get them really interested again in music, remembering why they pursued music in the first place and, and even wanting to practice more, things like that? Yeah. Well, that's, it's definitely something I think a lot about is motivation. Um, and certainly going through the last school year, where it's like, <laughs> don't get motivated about anything. Um, it's really been something that I, I think about a lot and that I try to strategize when I'm teaching to keep kids motivated. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things. The big thing for me, um, obviously they chose their instrument for a reason. Um, and so there's that intrinsic love there for the instrument right from the beginning. But to keep them really motivated for it, it's sort of that group cooperative um, feel. And I think that students love playing their instruments, but they also, maybe even more so than that, love playing their instruments with other people and making music together. And so if we can kind of um, create that culture in the classroom, that's what really is going to keep kids coming back um, and wanting to be motivated to practice, to learn, to try new things, um, to really challenge themselves. Um, cause it's a good challenge for them, but they're also part of this team. Um, so that's, that's really what I think about, um, when I'm teaching is that it's orchestra class, but it's also like orchestra team as cheesy as that sounds. Um, but kids really buy into that. And when they're a part of something that's bigger than just themselves, I mean, that's, that's really impactful. Um, as far as, uh, like what we do in class, um, I really like to keep things fresh. Um, it's important that we practice our skills every single day and do all of those things, but you can't start with G major every day. Like that's not going to inspire kids to, to keep learning. So try to keep things fresh, throw a lot of new ideas at them, um, do a lot of quirky things so that they're just not expecting to keep things like <laughs> and fun. Um, going through last year and being on Zoom while teaching, I at the beginning of the year, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so weird in front of my students. Like parents are going to see this. Um, and then I just got over it and we did it and, you know, we made the most of it. So there's that. And then um, students really want to learn new stuff all the way from when they start their instrument to, you know, when you're an adult and still practicing, you want to learn new things. And so continually throwing new concepts at them, um, musical concepts, um, technical concepts, um, concepts about being a group learner, um, about being a leader, 
all of those things are really intrinsic to the classroom. Um, and I think that that students, uh, if there's something new that they're going to learn each day and they know that going in, it's that little bit of extra excitement and motivation to come to class or to go home and work on that new skill. So um, that, that's a variety of things um, that I do in the day-to-day -to, -day to try and keep kids motivated to practice and keep learning. So I get to work with uh, at least 15, sometimes 20 high schools a year. Over the past 23 years, it's definitely over 100 high schools. And they are all, of course, it's very varied what sorts of um, results they get. They're all trying to be both technically accomplished and musically accomplished. Um, sometimes that's more successful than others. You have found a way to have your students at a very impressive level of having good setups, right, left hand, uh, use of bow, intonation even, and yet still also really play musically, sometimes very musically, just really not just doing dynamics for their own sake, but clearly for the, the plot of the music at hand. So what do you think are some of the things that you do that contribute to that level of, um, of success on the technical and musical fronts. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, I want to say we stumbled into it, but it's, it's more work than that. Um, it's a lot of planning and preparation. Um, so from the time that I get students in sixth grade, we really, really talk about technique. Um, and as every cellist knows, that's the foundation for anything you can do musically is having really solid technique. And we drill it a lot. Um, I just got done talking about how we keep things new and fresh, but at the same time, there's some things you have to go back to all the time. Um, and so we really drill those technical things a lot. At the same time, as a public school orchestra teacher, you gotta let some things go. Otherwise kids are, you know, the they wanna do well, but it's not gonna happen right away. So that's why we keep returning to things over and over and over. Um, but trying to find new fun ways to do it at the same time and, you know, really trying to inspire students to think about the music beyond just the notes and rhythms. Um, and it's easy as a musician, even an adult musician, to just play the notes and rhythms and forget about, like, why we're really making music. Um, and so really trying to get them to think outside the box. Um, something else that I really... Um, uh, like to do myself and encourage other teachers to do is pick music that students know. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something they know well or something that they like right away. But if they know what it's supposed to sound like, that will help with a lot of things. Um, it helps with intonation, helps with dynamics, it helps with just the overall um, musical feel. So I really encourage a lot of people to, you know, pick music that they know. At the same time, um, you got to pick a lot of stuff they don't know, too, um, to kind of broaden their view on music. Um, so that's a couple things. And um, there's a few other techniques that I, I uh, worked in my teaching a lot last year. And the big one is composing. So with all of the circumstances of teaching last year, we really dedicated a lot of time to creating music, um, composing on paper and on the screen as well through different notation. Um, softwares and whatnot, but also just recording themselves, uh, improvising, um, and just creating on their own. And I think it sparks a lot of ideas for students when they do that. And um, they sort of intrinsically include those ideas into their classroom playing and their orchestra playing as well. So I don't think that I've found a formula or anything, and there's certainly a lot of work to be done still. Um, but yeah, a lot of repetition and then, you know, really trying to keep things new for them as well and get them um, creating their own ideas outside of what's on the page. Great. Yeah. So you did mention one of the things that I wanted to, um, I, I figured was a, a part of the recipe, which is that repertoire selection. And I, I think of, for example, Samuel Applebaum traveling around in the middle of the 20th century and crediting finding the right piece you know just 
the pieces that that they can really excel at and sound good on, you know. So they're they're pieces that capture their interest, but that are are appropriate to the level of their technique, so they can really succeed and hear what they're able to accomplish. That definitely seems to be um, a key. And then your the mix of stuff that that they know and like, but then also, for example, in exposing them to stuff that you know and like, so that you can kind of show them your real passion for music. Like, like you're a big Mahler fan, for example, and you find ways, even if that means an arrangement in, in some cases, but just so that you can show what, what it is that drew you to music and why you're uh, looking forward every day to working on music and working with them as part of the team on music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've exhausted all of the good Mahler arrangements. I don't think there's any left. I've done a lot of looking. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's out there that they, they don't know about, but it's just good um, for them to know. Um, and students nowadays, they know the names Mozart and Beethoven and all of the you know great masters of music, but they don't really know that music. So you have to teach them about it. And I think through teaching them, they really do find a love for those those pieces. Um, and yeah, uh, it's interesting because when you're working through something like a Suzuki method or um, any young cellist or musician coming up, there's sort of a sequence of, of pieces at the beginning. And I'd be interested to hear your take on this, but I, I don't know necessarily agree with the sequence because I know the sequence is often technical and music uh, musicality related, but it doesn't really give a lot for like preference or, um, you know, what the student likes. And there might just be a tune that's really good for you technically, but if you can't buy into it, it's really, really tough. So I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts on, you know, the sequencing of, of music too, as students get older. It's true. It's, um, it is a very good thing to be able to keep the various levels clear in one's mind of, okay, this student is here. This is what's going to fit them like a glove, but then also have enough breadth in that particular category that it's not just, okay, and now is the point in your life when you play the 4A allergy, period, you know? Um, but, and I think that that gets easier, that is getting easier with not just things like the music that's available on IMSLP, but how there will be collections there where they'll, they'll just have all manner of, of lists. So even just accessing the, the Royal, uh, Royal School of Music, the lists that they use in, in England, for example, will often provide some alternatives that are like, oh, I never thought of this piece, or wow, I never even knew of this piece. And you find an IMSP and yeah, okay, great. This is similar enough, but different enough. And it's one that the student likes a lot more. So, I mean, it does seem like from an organizational standpoint that there is room for somebody doing a more comprehensive kind of a version of what they had for the ASTA syllabus and that now exists for the ASTACAP solos and just tries to really be as, as comprehensive as possible within each level. Um, and now nowadays with more focus also on just music from, whether it's from Asia or South America or you know other parts of the world and then figure out what levels those fit in. That, um, but I see that as improving over time. Do, do you as well? I think so too. Yeah. And even if you look at like newer method books, there's a lot more incorporation of um, all societies and trying to be really inclusive. And that's the landscape of our teaching too. Um, and I mean, we're so fortunate that the, the students that we have now are more diverse than ever before. And I think that, um, you know, mm -hmm. that's something that we can really capitalize as, as we're moving forward um, and trying to really celebrate those differences amongst our students. So, yeah, and I think that all ties into differences in repertoire too. Um, and no, no two students need the same thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And differences in interpretation. Yeah, yeah. definitely.
Well, now earlier you mentioned the word team, orchestra as a team. It also seems to me that you and your colleagues at the middle school and the high school have made yourselves into a very uh, cohesive team too. I mean, again, which maybe is a goal at a lot of places, but for various reasons, um, I don't know. You all seem to be really on board, on the same page. Can you, you want to talk a little bit about, is there some formula there too that you have words of wisdom about? Yeah, I don't know if it's a formula, but I, I certainly agree. Like, um, we all have good relationships and we talk about our teaching a lot. And I think it's really just that open dialogue and being comfortable to share what's working, what's not working, um, what's bothering us. That's that's really important. And something that I have stressed since I started in the district, too, and this has um, you know, been accepted by my colleagues because they feel the same way, is music is not competitive. It's cooperative. And at some levels, it is competitive. And that's that's certainly, um, you know, there's a time and place for that. When you get to the collegiate level, like it, it can be very competitive, the professional level, it's competitive. But what our students are looking for in uh, public schools is not competitive music, it's cooperative music. And I think that we buy into that as teachers as well. Um, and, you know, I found that cooperation among students, amongst teachers leads to higher motivation, um, as I talked about earlier. And competitiveness can lead to a lot of um, aggression, really, and um, pessimism, and uh, makes people feel left out and left behind. And that's just, that's not how I operate. So I, um, we really buy into that as a team, too, that, you know, music is for everyone, um, should be for everyone. And um, we work well as a team to really communicate that to our students as well. And I think it, it leads to a lot of student buy-in. So... Well, I was going to say, at the same time, I think you've, you've found ways for the ones who, who do want to, to play a solo or, or something like that. You know, you, you have found ways for them to have opportunities to, um, to shine as well. Uh, you know, because some people are just in orchestra because they... Uh, kind of maybe social reasons and they don't really put a whole lot of time and effort in beyond that. And other people are, are super gung ho. Um, yeah. I just think of you, you, the whole team of you have done a good job of um, looking for opportunities for if they have a solo that they have prepared or a solo within the orchestra that that's a reward for that extra practice if they get it to this level. And it, it's kind of, kind of funny because that competition can, it's sometimes amazing how much that fuels some of them. If there's that, that carrot of competition, they will practice endlessly in order to get to that, uh, whatever that goal is that, that they set or you set. Certainly. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think you're you're right on track. And there, I mean, there definitely is time and space for uh, competition. I'm an incredibly competitive person. <laughs> I don't play any board game against me because I'm a really <laughs> poor loser. But um, it's sort of that like internal competition, you know, the competition against yourself to uh -huh. improving. And um, I think through that, you can spotlight students and highlight students through solos and, um, you know, features on, on concerts and whatnot. And we do a lot of that in, in our district as well. Um, the, I guess the competition I should clarify what I'm against is group versus group or mm -hmm. uh, this orchestra versus this orchestra. That, that doesn't work well for me. But part of being that classroom teacher is accepting all students where they're at. And the students that want to be there because it's a social thing and they enjoy playing their instrument with friends, perfect. Like, I'm, I'm really happy they're there. We'll keep motivating them to keep working. And the students that are there because they want to be the best at their instrument, you have to get those students fired up too um, and keep pushing them. And so that that is certainly a challenge of the job. And I think when you graduate college and you come out of this environment that is very competitive and you're, you keep working to improve yourself as a musician, it's hard to then go into the public school setting where a lot of kids just want to play music <laughs> and be with their friends. So... 
that's an area that I think I've worked on a lot as a teacher and sort of find that balance for all students um, to make it enjoyable. And um, it's really easy to work with students that have that fire that just want to keep practicing and improving and will not stop until they get something. Um, and it takes that extra motivation for myself to really, um, you know, help the students that are maybe don't have that intrinsic drive so much, but are still um, there for the right reasons. Terrific. Well said. Hey, Bill, what are some of your projects or upcoming concerts? Yeah, so there's a lot going on right now. <laughs> the high school in Fort Atkinson has the Little Mermaid, which is going on next week. Uh, next weekend. So I will be living in the pit for the next two weeks. Um, I'm playing cello for that, which is it's fun. It's good to push myself on. I'm playing something like like that again. It's been a while since I've done a musical. So that's good. Um, we have some really exciting concerts coming up for um, students later this year. Um, our winter concert at the high school is band, orchestra, choir, all combined. It's our only concert like that. And we're doing a ton of combined music between the groups this year, which after last year, when we didn't get to do any of that, we're really excited about that. So that's happening. Um, and then later on in the year, we have a uh, concert that's going to be themed around rock and roll, which is going to be really, really exciting. And I, I haven't broken that news to students yet. So if they're watching, they'll, they'll find out. But um, <laughs> we recently uh, purchased an electric string quintet. So um, we purchased those, then we shut down. Um, this was back March of 2020, and they're kind of still sitting in the closet waiting to be broken out. Um, so we've used them a bit, but we're really going to kind of unleash them at that concert. Um, so that'll be fun. Outstanding. Excellent. All right. Well, this has been um, every bit as much fun as I knew it was going to be. It's always great to talk with you, Bill, and I'm glad that that you we had the opportunity for you to share these ideas with the viewers i know that it'll be very inspiring for them this weekend and beyond yeah well thank you so much for having me it's always great to talk with you as well and uh hope hope all is good with you terrific well thank you all right and viewers you know the drill now it's time to start practicing and and just just enjoy it and just keep going so we'll see you next Friday at five. Happy practicing in the meantime.